The Lord be with you. I welcome you all in the name of the Lord, our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, it's so wonderful to see all of you gathered here by the Holy Spirit. Uh, pray you'll be richly blessed tonight. This is the second to the last of our midweek Lenten services this year. We gather once more on Wednesday, and then comes Holy Week after that. We would, as we always do, ask you to uh, grab the welcome pads that are at the inside end of each row, if you would fill those out and pass them back and forth. We are uh, pleased to share these Lenten services again this year with our sister congregations, and so tonight we welcome Pastor Steve Alcott from uh, Christ the King, our sister congregation across town as our guest preacher. As you know by now, our, our theme for these services is the way of the cross, based on a, verse, a passage out of Mark 8. So we're reading the same gospel text each week, uh, but focusing on a different phrase each time. So tonight's uh, Steve focuses on uh, the four-foot life, or no. <laughs> Sorry. Forfeiting life. Dave, did you tinker with these announcements? <laughs> Either that or Dave's wearing off on me, and that's really a scary thought. Yeah? You really are welcome here. You know, we only torture you because we love you. That's that's how it goes. So. Well, as you know, we uh, combined these Lenten services with our confirmation ministry, and so I'll call on Kristen Durst for any uh, announcements about uh, the confirmation program tonight. I'm not here to make fun of Steve as much as I'm sure Dave would love me to. Um, <laughs> accolades for Sunday at the 8 o'clock, I have Wyatt and Eli, and then at the 10:10, I have Owen and Vincent. And then this is just an announcement uh, for an event that's coming up on the 14th. We have Powerhouse. There's a sign up that's been emailed and it's on Facebook. Look for that. We'd love to spend time with our middle schoolers. And that's all the announcements that I have. Also, uh, the date night uh, is coming up soon, but uh, this is the last week to get your tickets. So be sure you uh, pick those up before Friday or by this Friday. But with that, I invite you to rise and to share the peace of Christ with one another as we uh, prepare to sing our opening hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
litany tonight is from 1 Timothy chapter 6. There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, people of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we confess how easily we are enticed by the blessings of this world and treasure them more than the eternal gifts you give to us through Jesus. By your grace and forgiveness, save us from that inversion of values and lead us along the way of the cross, that we may follow in faith and obedience where Christ has led the way. Keep us steadfast in the faith, and at the last, raise us up to live with you through all eternity. For you live and reign with the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading today comes from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verses 32 to 35, and chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Eagerly expecting Christ's immediate return, the earliest Christians held their possessions in common, but temptation was never far off. This pa passage records of the devastating results when two members of the church succumbed to the love of money and literally forfeited their lives to gain the world. Reading from Acts. Now a whole group of those who believed were one, of one heart and soul, and no, no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to each as they had, any had needed. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife, Sephrina, sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge and kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did you not remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now when Ananias had heard these words, he fell down and died. A great fear seized all who heard it. The young men came, wrapped up his body, then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Look at the feet of those who have buried your husband or at the door and they will ca carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead. So they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. At the end, the great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. The word of the Lord. The second reading today is from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 23. In Jesus' parable of the rich fool, note that it was not greed for the bumper crop of his fields produced that made him a fool, but rather were those possessions promoted to him to put his trust. Reading from Luke. 
someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend who set me to be your drudge or a bitterator, a bitterator over you, he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. He, then he told them of a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? He, then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, so you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you, and all these things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. He said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and body more than clothing. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. I now invite the children to come forward for Faith Zine's vignette. Brad. You kind of look like Brad. Has anyone seen Brad? Brad! <sighs> I can't seem to find Brad anywhere. We yeah. need to we need to find him. We need to tell him we found his cross. That's right. You know, maybe we should ask our friends for help. Do you see Brad? Yeah. If you see Brad, point to him and say Brad. Yeah. Brad! <laughs> oh, Laura, Boots, I am sure glad to see you too. Brad, <sighs> we've been looking everywhere for you. We thought we lost you. Yeah, where did you go? I did get lost and I dropped my cross. I was trying to find something else that would help me find my way. Hey, Brad. Why do you have this little pouch? Oh, I was collecting coins so I could buy a taxi and pay them to take me to the cross. I collected as many as I could, but it still wasn't enough. I feel helpless. How do I get to the cross? Don't worry, Brad. We found your cross. Oh. You know... I mean, we have the cross, but I think we should keep the coins because, to be honest, I would rather ride in a taxi instead of walking. <laughs> I'm getting really tired. <laughs> no, Boots. We have to follow the cross. That's what the map told us to do. Here. Oh, thanks. But I just want to get back home to my comfy bed and all of my squishmallows. <laughs> And the best hot cocoa in the world. Oh, oh. man, that sounds really nice. <sighs> no, Boots, we're not, we're not going to give up. You know, let's see what the map has to say. Can you say map? Okay. Say it louder. <laughs> if there's a place you've got to go, I'm the one you need to know. I'm the map. I'm the map, I'm the map. If there's a place you've got to get, I can get you there, I bet. I'm the map. I'm the map, I'm the map, I'm the map. Congratulations, you found Brad and gave him his cross. Hooray! So far, you've denied yourself, taken up your cross, and saved your life. Wow, that sounds like a difficult journey. But now Brad wants to forfeit or give up. We need to help him continue on. Do you think that a taxi is the best way to get to the cross? No. That's right. So when Laura asks what to do next, say, don't give up, follow the cross. Say it with me. Don't, don't give, give up, up, 
follow the cross. the cross. So what do we need to do next? Don't give up, follow the cross. Oh, so I don't need these coins after all. No, Brad, only the cross will help us finish our journey on this path. Are you ready to move forward with us? I think I am. Uh, it's going to be hard, but I know that Jesus is with me. Oh, just like you and Laura are with me. That's right, Brad. You know, vamanos. Let's go. Okay. Thank you guys for coming up. Our gospel for this evening, and I don't know, should we have them stand or no? Do we stand? Yeah, All right, let's stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel comes to us tonight from Mark chapter 8, beginning with the 27th verse. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory, the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Please, you may be seated. Well, I am excited to be here again. You always have such a way to welcome me, and I thank you for that. I'll have you know I'm not four foot, I am proudly over five foot. <laughs> and uh, although it says Stephen in the uh, uh, bulletin, and I am Stephen, it's, it's spelled incorrectly in there. It's S-T-E-P-H-E-N, so. But uh, nevertheless, I bring you a warm hello from your friends over at Christ the King. And we're excited to continue this partnership for the sake of the gospel, and we pray blessings upon you over Lent as we move toward Easter. And so grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I remember when my older two daughters were little, they decided they wanted to ride the zipper at the McLeod County Fair. And it was the biggest of the rides there, the main attraction, if you will. And my wife and I weren't convinced that the girls were old enough yet. They were for sure not tall enough in our estimation. They are after our, our children. And... <laughs> No one in our family is accused of being tall. But the attendant that was at the ride assured us that they were indeed old enough and that they were tall enough and that everything would be just fine. In fact, he told us that they would even enjoy the view from up there. And so we gave the man some of the tickets uh, and away went our girls. And away they went is correct. Once the ride began, they were thrown into the air, tossed about, we can hear thumping and screaming and then more thumping as they flew higher and higher. It looked shaky at best, and the attendant who assured me that they would be just fine started to look a little concerned. And this made me concerned, and that of course made my wife concerned, and then now we're in trouble, right? I thought for a moment that my girls would forfeit their life, and I mean that. It was pretty scary, this experience. I thought that they were about to pay the ultimate price for having two negligent and, dare I say, dim-witted parents. 
And the ride continued for a few more moments and more thumping and screaming. And then, of course, it ended. And when it was all done, we were pleasantly surprised to see them alive. <laughs> and we were even more surprised that they were laughing and smiling and that they enjoyed every moment, even though they were rubbing their heads. And as promised, they even enjoyed the view. Now, truth be told, my whole family, we're all thrill seekers, each and every one of us. We love roller coasters and big falls. We love the loops, but I am 100% certain. I have no doubt at all that I would not have loved that ride, not one bit. And I would have screamed for the ride to end and for the conductor to let me off. And I have to think that Peter feels a little bit like that this evening. After hearing Jesus plainly explain what it means to follow him, what it looks like to be his disciple, after hearing about the loops and the twists and the turns in a life following Jesus, well, I think Peter and the others wondered what kind of ride they had gotten themselves into. The ride isn't looking so smooth anymore, not for them, and if we're honest, certainly not for us. Over Lent, we're exploring this theme, the way of the cross, and it's all centered around Mark chapter 8. And the text begins with Jesus asking his disciples an important question. Who do people say that I am? And then he asks it again, but this time it's much more personal. He asks them, who do you say that I am? And it's a fantastic question that he asks of you and me as well. Who do we say that Jesus is when it comes to our life? Is he our Lord? Is he our God? Do we pay much attention to him and his word at all. Now, Peter nails it. He nails the test. You are the Messiah, the Christ. Peter was confessing Jesus to be the anointed one and the one promised by the prophets of old. God's people had been expecting the Messiah for centuries, and Peter figured it out. He got it right. He nailed it. Now, think about this. It must have been a huge moment for him. One of his best moments for sure. But before he even had a chance to enjoy the view, the ride quickly changes. Jesus begins to teach them that he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And he goes on to tell them that he is to be killed. Now, this is not what Peter had in mind. Messiahs don't suffer. God doesn't die. This seemed insane. So he took Jesus aside and he rebuked him. Peter rebuked Jesus. Now, Jesus' response to Peter is a sharp one. He says to Peter right in front of all of the other disciples, get behind me, Satan. And he begins to teach them about the kind of ride that they've all signed up for, of crosses and losing life. And this seems a far cry from the healing that they all just witnessed at Bethsaida or the feeding of thousands that Jesus did just earlier in the same chapter. Those seemed like rock star moments, big, extravagant, amazing, highest point of the roller coaster kind of moments, the kind of thing that you would hope to have in this ride of life. But this teaching, this teaching is something else. The way of the cross is a hard one, and there is to be suffering. Now, Jesus is clear about suffering, and we're not fans of suffering. When suffering comes, as fellow preacher Peter Nesco once put it, we tend to instruct God on how we should do things. We rebuke him for not following our commands. We become unfaithful. And we close our eyes and plug our ears to the parts of Jesus' message that seem unpleasant or hard. You know, we don't mind when the ride is exciting, full of twists and turns. I think of things like mission trips and soup suppers and fellowship time where we have together. Those are great moments. But a ride full of suffering, well, that's not something any of us want. That's what's happening here in our text. Peter couldn't handle the kind of suffering that Jesus was speaking about so he plugged his ears to the truth and he tried to get Jesus in line maybe you've done the same thing but yet the way of the cross is full of suffering and so over Lent we are 
talking about each of the themes found in Mark 8, and we're breaking them down. And my theme is the four-foot life, or to forfeit life. <laughs> Jesus says, for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? And some translations say soul. In Greek, these two words are often kind of interchangeable, not really, but sometimes. And this actually connects back to the Hebrew when we hear about how God breathed breath, a.k.a. soul, a.k.a. life, into us. And thinking about life and soul, I was immediately drawn to another gospel text. And, you know, it's kind of funny. The other preachers in this round robin picked an epistle or some Old Testament reading, but not me. I do my own thing. And so I started thinking about forfeiting life and soul and gaining the whole world, and I was brought to the 12th chapter of Luke. And in this tiny little text, there is greed and idolatry and selfishness. It's all in there. It's jammed in like one of those little hot pockets full to the brim with meats and cheeses, except instead it's jam-packed with the kinds of themes that make for great TV. Greed, idolatry, selfishness. We know all about this. A text that is all about gaining the world the worldly way, living for oneself and running from all suffering. And we find that someone from the crowd calls upon Jesus to settle a dispute, a dispute between two brothers about estates. It reminds me of Mary and Martha arguing about work, right? This time it's two brothers arguing about estates, a debate that sounds much more like mine, mine, mine than anything else. And instead of just answering them about who should get what, Jesus uses this occasion as an opportunity to warn them and to warn you and me about getting attached to worldly things. Point blank, point blank, he warns them about greed. And to really drive home this point, to make it sink in, Jesus tells them a parable. He tells them a story. There was a rich man, starts the story. And have you ever noticed in Jesus' parables, there's always a rich man. There's a rich man now who has food, all the food he could ever need. And it's all stored up in the barn out back. He's all set. And those around him see that he's successful. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when the new crop comes in, he had so much that he didn't even know what to do with it. And so with all the poor around him, with people starving, he has a plan. What's he going to do? Fill the community food pantry to the brim. No. Well, sell off what he doesn't need to help others, right? Nope. Instead, he's going to rip down the old barn and build a bigger one to stuff more in. I'm going to jam-pack that baby, and then you know what I'll do, he says? I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods, ample goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. Live it up. And the rich man had got it in, into his head that it was time to sit back and rest his soul. And God says, what a fool. What a fool. Thinking that life is about accumulating as much as you can, what a fool. And I think we all tend to be like this supposed rich man. You know, the mistake of the rich man is not that he was full of riches or that he had success. The sin is not that he had a barn or multiple barns. The folly is not that he had an abundance. The sin, the mistake, the folly is thinking that it was all his, that it was his life his soul. Where he went wrong was thinking that everything he had was something that he earned all on his own. He's a fool because he believed that the barn, the food, even his soul belonged to him. And his mind was stuck on earthly things and he neglected to see the things of God. You see, he failed to see it all as gift, as a blessing. Even deeper, his sin was that he put his hope, his trust, his worth, his pride, his worship in his stuff. He put his worship, he put his security in his stuff. And this is idolatry, avoiding suffering at all costs. It speaks to our desires to be safe or to abstain, excuse me, to obtain a false sense of security. His sin was trusting in man-made things and not in God. And perhaps to go further, he took even his soul for granted. Fool, says God. Now back in Mark chapter 8, Jesus says, 
What good is it for a person to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And you see, this stands in direct confrontation with what the world teaches. The world teaches us to be comfortable, to take care of oneself, do what makes you feel good. The end will always justify the means. Choose comfort, comfort, comfort. Heck, even some TV preachers manipulate this. Give a little now, give a little more now, and watch. See how God blesses you with wealth and abundance. It's a promise of earthly comfort. But he's a good father, and he wants you to be comfortable, to avoid all suffering, right? But is that what Jesus says here? Or is that what we wish Jesus said here? We wish the way of the cross was a bit more like the lazy river. I love the lazy river, right? You just get on and float, and you just float through life with no pushback for our faith, no temptation to abandon Jesus and head our own way, no suffering, no pain, no hardships. We wish the way of the cross was like that lazy river. But if we're honest, it's more like the zipper. I mean, For me, this text hurts. It catches me right between the eyes. Jesus today highlights for me what a fool I am highlights just how much I like to be comfortable, how much I put comfort above all else. And it also, it also highlights for me how comfortable I am with having two gods. One, the first God, Jesus. I really do want him to be the Lord of my life. I want him to instruct me to where I should go. I want him to lead me in how I should be. I want him to ever mold me into his disciple. I know that he knows what is best. But two, I also don't mind following the God that is the world. I want to store up for myself wealth and security and comfort. I want to trust in me. I want to live for me and build my kingdom. I want what I want when I want it. Does that sound familiar? Now Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself. And to that, we say, no thanks. Get me off this ride. Like the zipper at the county fair, I'm thrown around by Jesus' words today, tossed back and forth, and I fear I'm not going to survive his teaching. And I can assure you, I don't much like the view. And what I find is that I don't really want to deny myself, and I suspect that you don't either. And that is perhaps because, as always, we focus on ourselves. We're good at that. We take care of the old Adam. What we fail to see here is that Jesus goes on to do the very thing he laid out for us. We don't deny ourselves, not fully anyway, but he does. Jesus does. Jesus goes to the cross and endures the pain, the suffering, the sin for his followers who can't deny themselves. The way of the cross is painful and troubling for sure. It requires a selflessness that you nor I can muster up. But Jesus is different. He has his eyes, his heart, his soul set on redemption. Jesus walks the way of the cross, and he goes for Peter. He walks for James. He goes for you. Now, this season of Lent is a time of repentance, a time to see the mess our sin has made in our life, A time to contemplate that we are dust and to dust we shall return. A time to see that everything we have, everything we are, everything belongs to God, even our soul. And to secure that soul, Jesus forfeit his life. Embracing the cross, shedding his blood, he does all this for you. For you, Jesus took upon himself all the sin, all the shame, All the fake worldly comfort for you, Jesus, clothes himself with all that death and muck, and he makes his way to the cross. He suffered. Jesus died, was placed in a tomb. But it didn't end there. It doesn't end there because resurrection is coming. Salvation is coming. Easter awaits for those who are in Christ, for those whom the Spirit calls to faith. Salvation comes The tomb is empty, grave clothes abandoned, his body gone. We are Easter people. Our hope, our trust, our faith is not in our ability to someday walk the way of the cross sufficiently. But instead, our hope, 
Our trust and faith is in Jesus, the one who walked the road on our behalf. He walked it on our behalf all the way to glory. So Lent then is not a time where we sacrifice ourselves as a way to show God that we are worthy, but instead a time where we can see that Jesus forfeit his life because we aren't. We aren't worthy. In love, Jesus forfeit his life to save his people, and that, my friends, includes you. So dear Christian friends, the way of the cross is painful and bloody. We would do well to watch in awe as our Jesus goes before us to draw us to himself. See, he forfeits his life for you. All praise to you, O Christ. Amen. Please rise as together we confess our Christian faith using the words of the explanation of the second article of the Creed from Martin Luther's small catechism. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has the of a lost and condemned creature and has freed me from sin, death, and the power of the devil, not with silver and gold, but with his holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. He has done all this in order that I might be his own, live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, even as he is risen from the dead and lives and reigns for all eternity. This is most certainly true. 
Please be seated as we worship God now with our Lenten offering.
Let us bow our heads and hearts together in prayer. O oh Lord our God, just as with our first parents, Adam and Eve, our greatest and most foolish sin is to think that we can be like you, run our own lives according to our own wills and not yours. Send the Holy Spirit to make us aware in each moment that our lives are a gift from you, so that we may never exchange this gift for the unprofitable things of this world. Turn our eyes and hearts again and again to Christ crucified, most especially in those times when suffering afflicts us in this life, so that we might cling to him alone in faith, and gladly follow him on the way of the cross. Lord God, we ask tonight for your special blessing on the people of Christ the King and the ministry of Pastor Steve there. Guide and provide for them as they seek a third pastor to serve among them. And grant the congregation all the resources it needs for its mission to flourish and may continue to proclaim that Christ Jesus is Lord. Gracious God, we continue to pray your blessing on these Lenten services in each of the churches where they occur. Bind us together as sisters and brothers in Christ who support each other in a united witness to the good news of the gospel. Continue to make each church an outpost of your kingdom, serving your will in all that we say and do. All of these things, O Lord, the prayers that flow out of our hearts and those greater divine gifts that only you know that we need. We pray all in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please rise to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.